Well, hello, everybody. Can you hear all right? Uh, I'm going to give a, a, a talk today of uh, great import uh, because most people aren't aware of what's going on uh, in science, uh, particularly astronomy. Right now, the two fields that are growing more than any others are medicine and uh, astronomy. Um, I guess politics, too. <laughs> uh, there will be no politics in this lecture. There are, however, five commercials. <laughs> uh, I'm really not sure about the medicine part, but I know that astronomy really is growing. I'll be uh, doing this quickly. I'm going to try to cover everything there is now and everything there has been and everything that will be all in about uh, an hour plus. So. <laughs> We'll be rushing through this. Um, you can go home after uh, the event's over, but uh, remember the test is at 6 p.m. <laughs> so we expect you all back. Uh, this opening slide is uh, the Andromeda Galaxy. It's about uh, two and a half million light years away. I'm going to explain light years just uh, in case somebody's not familiar with it in just a moment. Uh, basically, it means light took two and a half million years to come to us from this galaxy before this image was taken. Uh, this image was taken at uh, the Jack C. Davis Observatory, uh, which is uh, uh, my new career. <laughs> um, and it's a beautiful galaxy. It has more stars than our galaxy, the Milky Way. Uh, to explain the, uh, the uh, speed of light, uh, speed, the light travels at 186 miles every second, 186,000 miles every second. So the moon's about a quarter of a million miles away, so it takes a second and a half for the light to come uh, from the moon to your eyeball. Uh, the sun's 93 million miles away, so it takes about eight and a half minutes for the light to come to, the, uh, to us from our sun. It took two and a half million years traveling at that speed for this image to get to us. This thing may be gone. Uh, right now, we don't know. Chances are it's not. Uh, and as an example, uh, I'm going to use the X-15 rocket plane. Uh, it set a speed record of 6.7 um, uh, times the uh, uh, speed of sound, uh, actually a little higher than that, uh, which was... Uh, 4,500 miles an hour. If you uh, left Earth in the uh, X-15 and traveled 24-7 uh, to try to get to the nearest star, which is Alpha Centauri, it would take you three quarters of a million years to get to the closest star in the fastest uh, in-atmosphere aircraft ever built. Because that closest star is about four and a third uh, light years away. How far, how fast is that uh, light speed? Well, uh, light travels about six trillion miles uh, in, in a year. So if you went to Alpha Centauri, you'd have to cover 27 trillion, 600 billion. I should have put a one at the end of that. But. <laughs> After you've traveled 27 trillion miles, one mile, either way, to, doesn't make any difference. Uh, so the, uh, some of the distances I'm going to give you, most of them, in this lecture are, are light years. How far away uh, light uh, travels in one year times distance. Uh, so basically, space is big. Uh, that may not come as a surprise to some of you. And that uh, concludes our presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're talking about infinity. Infinity is uh, a difficult com concept. I'm not going to go in it, into it much. Uh, this is the symbol for infinity, which is a Mobius strip. Uh, Mobius was a mathematician a long time ago. Um, I like this uh, cartoon because anybody who's had kids and gone on a trip uh, kind of identifies with this. Um, the uh, it just never ends, infinity. 
uh, the definition, uh, the actual definition for infinity means boundless. So it's senseless to think you're going to get to the edge of the universe. There is no edge. Anything beyond an edge would be nothing, and nothing itself is a construct. So infinity includes uh, everything that's created, everything that uh, is not created yet, uh, everything that exists, has existed, or will exist, uh, everything that does not exist or has never existed. And everybody goes, what the heck is all that about? <laughs> well, um, it's the fact that uh, mass, uh, matter, is never destroyed. So if suddenly we're going to have some nothingness somewhere, that has to be something, nothingness, uh, because it fills what? Space. Nothingness fills space. So this is a concept that uh, is the basic of physics, and we go by this all the time. So everything that's ever was or ever will be is existent around you uh, because all of that stuff uh, exists, and it exists forever. It may exist in a gaseous form. It may be uh, solid material, maybe frozen, whatever. It may exist at the subatomic level, really tiny, or not. <clears throat> one of the theories about this everything, and everything that exists and everything that will exist, one of the theories is that uh, it's vast. Its vastness is uh, you can't calculate it. Uh, and because of that, there is uh, some mathematics that go to show that there are multiple uh, universes. And that in itself is a misnomer because a uh, universe on, a, on its own is everything. And yet there may be parallel ones. And you've probably heard about parallel universes, reflections of ours. So if this is true, and there may be infinite number of parallel universes, in other universes, there is a room just like this with a crowd just like this. And uh, I know you all think you're one of a kind. <laughs> but uh, I do. So anyway, excuse me, I just had an identity crisis. Um, <laughs> so this room like this with people that look like you in count, uncounted uh, uh, universes, but each one has a little difference. Uh, maybe in one, um, the microphone is down a little bit. Maybe in another, uh, the difference is something else. Maybe it's the color, maybe it's the level of light. Uh, but that is reflected uh, infinite number of times. And these are not uh, folks who uh, uh, dropped out of school in the second grade. These are guys that, uh, and women that, um, I'm kind of old, so I always add women. When I first was giving lectures a long time ago, I would talk about men do this, men do that. And then I had three daughters. <laughs> and it changed rapidly. Uh, so uh, there is a parallel universes. Uh, as an example, a simplistic example, I have this as an example. Uh, you can get different results in uh, different universes. Uh, this is just before she got the restraining order. Uh, so, uh, we're going to head out uh, starting in, uh, uh, at the sun. Uh, the solar system is much bigger than we uh, always thought when I was in school. Uh, you know, there were um, nine planets. Pluto was a planet. It's no longer a planet. Um, we uh, thought Saturn had 17 moons. You'll see that's not the, not the case, and so on. So this was the solar system we were used to. I put an X over uh, Pluto. Uh, this is all dependent on the sun, of course. And now we are investigating a new planet, which is going to be called the ninth planet. They're really booting Pluto to the side. And so to uh, uh, go through this, I wanted to show you, um, if you used a typical uh, uh, filter, a cheap filter, and you looked at the sun, you'll either get a globe shape uh, with some overbursting like this. So this is kind of the uh, understood uh, picture of the sun. Uh, but a lot of observatories uh, like ours has taken uh, 
taken images of the sun. We have a solar uh, telescope. And this is an actual photograph of what the sun really looks like. Uh, that is uh, called a coronal mass ejection. It's just a giant solar flare. The sun is so wide, you could line up 109 Earth side by side to make up the diameter of the sun. If, if you took the Earth and uh, placed it next to the sun, the Earth is about this size. So let's just say about the size of the laser. So if the Earth was up here, uh, this hundreds of thousands of mile long solar flare would dwarf it. It'd be like, uh, somebody asked me, would that be like a ping pong ball under the arch of the west, you know, in St. Uh, St. Louis. Um, so the sun's big. Uh, the white spots are, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the white spots are hot spots, uh, black spots, which are sometimes called solar uh, sun spots. They're actually cold spots. So the cold spots are all the way down to about 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Mercury's really tiny first planet, 3,000 miles in diameter. Uh, it's uh, kind of exactly in between the size of our moon and Mars. Uh, it, uh, it's close to the sun, so it orbits in only 88 days. We do not have a good uh, photograph of the entire sun, uh, excuse me, Mercury. Uh, so this is stitched together. This is a mosaic of many photographs. Um, on the surface of Mercury, because it's the closest planet to the sun, uh, it's about uh, 500, 550 degrees on the surface. But it's not the hottest planet. The hottest planet is the next planet out, Venus. Mercury's 30 million miles from the sun. Venus is another 30, easy to remember for your test. 60 million miles from the sun is Venus. But Venus has an atmosphere. You can see it here. It's a gaseous atmosphere. It has uh, carbon dioxide, um, helium, methane. Uh, that atmosphere keeps it warm. That really is a greenhouse effect planet. So the surface of Mercury, uh, excuse me, v Venus, even though it's twice as far away from the sun as Mercury, the surface on Venus is almost twice as hot. Venus ranges between 800 degrees and uh, uh, 900 or so degrees, and Mercury's only 500. That's because the heat on the planet is not allowed to radiate out uh, during times of darkness. Otherwise, if you lived in Las Vegas, it'd be 115 degrees day and night. Uh, this should look familiar. Uh, our Earth is uh, 8,000 miles in diameter plus. Of course, uh, it takes us 365 days to go around the sun. Uh, we're 93 million uh, miles out. So it's easy to remember these. Uh, Mercury 30, Venus 60, Earth 93. Uh, we take a big jump when we go to Mars. It's about 140 million miles. Um, Earth, uh, just right. Uh, the biggest news, one of the biggest news in astronomy lately is the exoplanet search. We are searching for uh, planets that orbit distant stars. I'll give you the count at the beginning of this month uh, in, a, in a minute. Uh, so we're finding all these planets. Uh, about 2,000 of them are in uh, zones that probably are pretty close to having uh, relatively the same temperatures as Earth, which gives us the possibility of liquid water on the surface. I'll just tell you now, we have found over 5,000 new planets orbiting distant stars. Uh, the moon, of course, uh, <laughs> uh, the moon, uh, the latest theory is that uh, a uh, runaway planet or a large asteroid the size of Mars slammed into Earth at a relatively low speed, about 5,000 miles an hour, um, about 4 billion years ago. When it hit Earth, it was going so slow, it wasn't a shattering event. It was an assimilation of material. So it slammed into the Earth. Uh, material called ejecta was thrown around the Earth, that did not go into the Earth, and it coalesced on the other side of the Earth because of gravity and became the moon. But half of that Mars-sized object stayed uh, as part of the Earth, and that's why we are uh, twice the size, almost, of uh, Mars. That's how we think the moon was formed now. Which 
I don't know, I'm not the, the greatest scientist in the world, but that sounds more plausible <laughs> than uh, cheese. <laughs> These are the moon men. The moon men looking for intelligent life sometimes mistakenly look for it in California. Uh, Mars is uh, interesting. It's been a topic of uh, interest for mankind forever. Mars was first observed by the ancient Greeks, uh, guys like Aristophanes in the third century BC uh, uh, tried to study Mars, but there were no telescopes until 1609 in the, in, uh, the Dutch did that. And then Galileo took one of those that only had four power magnification and boy, he really ran with it. Um, but the Egyptians and the Greeks studied Mars. Uh, it's easy to see. It is orangish in color. Um, it is never the size of the full moon. Every year when, March, uh, when Mars is at its closest point to Earth, uh, <laughs> newspapers say, uh, tonight Mars will be the largest it will be all year in the sky. Look for it to be the same size as the full moon. And I don't know where they came with that, but of course that's ludicrous. Um, Mars uh, is hard to get to. We've uh, tried many times. We are the most successful country in space. The United States has sent 22 missions to Mars, starting with flybys, uh, then orbiters, and then landers, stationary landers, and now we have rovers wandering around Mars. Out of 22 missions, we've only had five failures. The Soviet Union, and then later, of course, Russia, uh, had a total of uh, 19 attempts to do those things. And they never, uh, they just were never really totally successful. And they had 14 that were complete failures out of 19. So I just thought I'd wave the flag a little. Um, this is uh, the first uh, photograph, actually it's the second. The first photograph that uh, Viking 2 lander, our lander, did in 1976 was looking down at one of its foot pads. Uh, but in fact, that's been confused in history because we sent two of these landers. That's why this one's called number two. That's basic science. <laughs> that is addition 101. And so uh, number one uh, had a black and white camera, took a picture of its foot, uh, number the pad. Number two took this picture in 1976 showing a uh, reddish uh, soil, uh, mostly uh, boulders and sand. Uh, I know that uh, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist uh, because I don't believe in that sort of thing, but I, I'm going to uh, give you some news tonight. In all these years since then, 40 years, the actual original photograph uh, has never been released. This is a doctored photograph. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, show you the real one. <laughs> yep. Uh, clearly, clearly on his way to Tokyo. Uh, we have a lot of uh, rovers uh, that we sent to Mars that have been very successful. The Opportunity rover uh, this January uh, past 12 years of moving around on Mars, taking samples and pictures, 12 years. The mission was uh, guaranteed to last uh, at least 90 days. It's been 12 years. It's collected all kinds of material. Um, in those 12 years, this one moves really slow. It uh, just recently exceeded 28 miles. It took 28 miles uh, travel in uh, 12 years. My mother must be driving. <laughs> if you're ever out here on Mill Street and there's a car in front of you, a white car, that's going like four miles an hour. This was the second picture. <laughs> I love this picture. <clears throat> okay. I'm not going to leave Mars quite yet because the most important thing that's occurred on Mars, and it's uh, the gr one of the biggest pieces of news in science, don't worry, I'm not building up a joke here. 
Uh, biggest uh, news in uh, science in ages until another one that I'll tell you about, most recent, and that's the search for water on Mars. You know, we discovered water on the moon uh, back in uh, 2007 through 2009 in the L Cross uh, missions. We had impacted a rocket fuselage into a crater at the south pole of the moon called Cabius A, that's the name of it. And uh, the follow-up spacecraft uh, used a spectrograph, which is a way to tell material. And when that uh, fuselage hit the crater at the south pole of the moon, it put up uh, dust and dirt. The dirt's called regolith. And amongst that was water. In fact, uh, that one impact yielded uh, what we would estimate to be about 500 gallons of water, and not uh, deuterium, which has extra hydrogen atoms, uh, heavy water, not that, H2O, our water. And it makes sense, because remember, the moon formed from a collision with, with uh, Earth. Uh, so we now know uh, the moon has water. It's frozen below the uh, surface, lots of water. That's why Japan and China both are planning to put a moon base. They can distill that uh, and refract it down uh, to uh, hydrogen, which is fuel. Rockets use hydrogen. And then uh, break it down, of course, and get oxygen. Well, on Mars, there were channels and uh, uh, grooves, ravines, uh, in uh, lots of places. In this particular photograph, taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, you can see these gullies, and uh, they were really interesting. Uh, a scientist at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory noted that there was a change in one of them, and so they retasked the uh, Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter satellite to pass over another crater, a larger one, uh, throughout the seasons on Mars. Mars has four seasons. And what it did is it kept uh, taking pictures of that crater it was passing uh, every time. They got a mul multitude of uh, pictures uh, throughout the seasons in one Mars year. A Mars year is uh, longer than a year on Earth. Uh, and I'm going to show you what uh, now, finally, NASA has released this to the internet. Uh, we got this uh, sequence you're going to see at the observatory because we are connected with, uh, with NASA. Some scientists say this is the most important uh, sequence uh, of image, images ever taken. What you are looking at is moving water on the surface of Mars. Now, this isn't, you know, the Mississippi River, but it's seepage. It's uh, breaking surface tension, so you can actually photograph it. We believe it's coming out of strata. This is the edge of the crater, edge of the crater and uh, there's a top... Uh, upper rock, a crust, and uh, stratification water seeps out uh, at the beginning of the Mars summer and flows down into the crater. And then in the Mars late summer and fall, it evaporates. This is astounding because the average temperature on uh, Mars is 81 degrees below zero. We have found water on the moon, on Mars, and one other place which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, you don't have to be a geek necessarily to see that this is really important. Okay, so I'm obsessed. <laughs> this lecture, I wanted to give you a nonstop science, so there's only 37 slides of Angelina. <laughs> After Mars, we have the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt uh, com is composed of uh, two million plus uh, chunks of rock. There is another two million chunks of rock divided into two groups of a million each that travel in the orbit of Jupiter, one million uh, in front of it, one million right after Jupiter. Uh, this is all material that uh, either was a planet in formation or a planet that uh, had been struck by another object, a large asteroid and broken into pieces. It doesn't matter, but it's all planetary material. Asteroids are rocks, okay? Um, and that's where their path, between Mars and Jupiter. 
These are the two groups that are in, uh, in front of and behind Jupiter. In total in that area, uh, four million plus, ranging in size from a grain of sand to Ceres, which is the largest uh, asteroid at 600 miles in diameter. Vesta, the second largest asteroid, is 327 miles in diameter. If we got hit with any of those, we'd be in big trouble. The uh, asteroid that uh, hit the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago was uh, 10 kilometers in diam diameter, six miles. That's it, six mile diameter rock. We estimate there are well over 600,000 asteroids in the asteroid belt bigger than that. And that one killed off the reptiles, so look out. Uh, Jupiter is huge. Jupiter has 63 moons that we know, uh, we know of. Jupiter is gigantic. You could put 17 Earths across it, and yet it spins one day on Jupiter is only nine Earth hours. Jupiter's spinning at uh, uh, a great speed. That's why the winds on Jupiter can sometimes reach 1,500 miles an hour. It's not the wind, it's not the atmosphere moving, it's a planet moving in its own atmosphere, so it has terrible winds. Uh, Jupiter, uh, Jupiter is a dangerous environment. This atmosphere is really thick. There's really probably no distinction when you uh, step on ground because there probably isn't uh, a, uh, a border between atmosphere and ground. It just gets mushier, mushier, then more solid. Uh, it's big. The outer four planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they're all giant gas giants like this. The inner four planets, are terrestrial, and the scientists used to call them rocks. That's why Earth was called third rock from the sun. That's why that TV show, that's where they got the name. Uh, if you lined, if you uh, compared the sun, Jupiter, and, and uh, Earth, that's the relative size. This is in scale. Um, so Earth is just this tiny little thing, uh, but it works. This uh, photograph was taken by the New Horizons mission, which uh, just uh, last summer did a flyby of Pluto and its moons. And uh, when it went past Jupiter, it took this photograph. This is one of the most uh, beautiful images that we've ever seen uh, with regard to space objects. Uh, that's uh, Jupiter's moon Io uh, in the picture um, and Jupiter behind it. Of course, the moons, just like our moon, they go through the same phases as, uh, as their uh, planet does. And they're both uh, showing this beautiful uh, partial crescent. Uh, pretty amazing. That uh, spot there, uh, it changes colors. They call it the big red spot in some palettes. In other words, some cameras use a different palette. That sometimes it'll look rosy red, sometimes a little whitish. Uh, that spot. Uh, is called the big red spot because there's two spots, the other one's smaller. So scientists being geeks and having no imagination whatsoever called it the big red spot. Uh, I work with uh, engineers. Uh, God help me. Uh, this is Saturn. When I was a kid, uh, we thought Saturn had 17 moons. Uh, not so. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, named 62 moons, and there are nine uh, uh, more that have not yet been named. Uh, Saturn is big, it'll hold inside its volume, 760 Earths, um, <clears throat> but it's beautiful. Uh, the observatory is open on uh, Saturday nights uh, year-round. It's the Jack C. Davis Observatory on the hill of above Western Nevada College. I lecture there uh, every month on weekend. Uh, you can get that schedule uh, on the web or on my website. Uh, just Mike Thomas lectures. It's easy to remember because I would have forgotten it. Uh, Saturn changes its uh, relative position when viewed from Earth. Uh, every 11 years, it goes through a cycle where the rings are tilted up, and then uh, we see them go down until they're um, equatorial to us, like this one. And then it goes all the way through the other cycle. It takes 11 years to do that. It's the most popular thing for kids to look at if they come to uh, any observatory. 
uh, and it always looks fake. All photographs and telescope images of Saturn look fake. Uh, it just think, oh, somebody taped that on the end of the telescope. Um, but that's just the way it looks because the clarity is always good. <clears throat> uh, uh, Uranus has rings, just like Saturn. They're just harder to see. Guess what else? Jupiter has rings. Um, uh, and uh, Uranus, Neptune, four of the, all four gas giants have rings. They're ice particles. Uh, some of them are ionized particles like Aurora Borealis. When they first saw these lights on Uranus, all of the alien, uh, aliens live people said, oh my gosh, there's cities there. Uh, lots of scientists thought maybe it's volcanic activity, but no, it is aurora, it's aurora borealis occurring uh, in the atmosphere of Uranus. Neptune, the farthest planet uh, uh, until now. Um, and it's big too, all the gas giants are quite large. Neptune is, Neptune is 2.8 billion miles from the sun. Uh, New Horizons spacecraft went past Pluto. We had terrible pictures of Pluto. Even the Hubble telescope pictures of Pluto were, showed no detail. Uh, as the New Horizons uh, spacecraft got closer and closer to Pluto, uh, last July it came within 7,000 miles of Pluto. It was whizzing by at 31,000 miles an hour. So it was uh, close to Pluto for like 10 minutes. But it took some amazing photographs. Uh, this is Pluto with its moon Charon in the background. Uh, Pluto turns out to be very interesting. This broad area of white is a frozen ocean. And uh, the, on the edges of it uh, are glaciers that come out of mountains that are huge mountains, 11,000 foot tall mountains on Pluto. And Pluto is only 1,500 miles in diameter. You could take Pluto, set it down on the United States, and you know, it'd be from like the Sacramento Valley to like Chicago or something, very small. But to have 11,000 foot mountains on it is uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, this is a close up. I don't know what I did here. Um, the close up of Pluto, uh, that's the frozen sea. Uh, here's the great news from Pluto, I guess it's great. Uh, these glaciers I told you about that come out of these mountains, they're in movement. These are glaciers that are moving. Close-ups of these show that the ice is fracturing along the rim of the mountains because of this ice coming into it. Uh, here you can see some of that fracturing. Uh, these mountains through this area, and especially that one, that one's about 12,000 feet high from the level of the uh, frozen ocean. The most amazing picture, this is Pluto when the uh, New Horizons spacecraft had gone by. Uh, it turned its camera and took a picture of Pluto in the rearview mirror, so to speak. And you can see the uh, uh, curvature of Pluto. You can see the frozen uh, mountains. And you can see the atmosphere. We now know Pluto has an atmosphere. We didn't expect that. Uh, it's got a high concentration of nitrogen, but it has a pretty good uh, concentration of uh, oxygen. So that's a big deal. By the way, what I found the most interesting is these mountains that are 11,000 feet high, they are not rock and earth. Uh, I guess you can't call it earth, dirt. They're solid ice. There is nothing like this on our, that on our planet. You can get an iceberg that's pretty tall, that's all ice. These mountains are solid ice. Um, so what does that mean? Well, I don't know. I have no idea. Chances are deep frozen oceans were uh, fractured during the cooling of a volcanic period, and you had an upthrust of uh, these mountains. So I guess I have a little idea, but uh, that'll be on the test. Past, uh, uh, in the area of Pluto is this thing called the Kuiper Belt. Now this, remember the asteroid belt is down here between Mars and Jupiter, and that's all rock. This stuff in the Kuiper Belt is out uh, uh, beyond Neptune. The, these are called trans-Neptunian objects, and they're all ice. Any, any comet that uh, swings past the Earth and past the Sun, any comet that uh, reoccurs 
uh, within 200 years or less comes from the Kuiper belt. Uh, those are called short period comets. And all that is is some near, nearby object, maybe Neptune. Uh, the gravity causes uh, some of these chunks of ice to move a little as Neptune goes by. That's called gravity perturbation. And uh, when it does that, some chunks of ice will bump into each other. One might get bumped a little bit farther away from the sun, and it'll stay up in that orbit. One might get bumped, doesn't take much, uh, some number of miles towards the sun. Well, then the sun's gravity picks it up and pulls it, and it comes down and it passes the inner planets. And then uh, swings around the sun, slingshots back out, comes back, same period. Uh, um, Halley's Comet, it's Halley, not Haley. Halley's Comet comes by every 75 plus years, like clockwork. Last time, 1986, before that, 1910. Uh, the Voyager spacecraft, which were launched 38 years ago, uh, at 24-7 uh, for 38 years, going 40,000 miles an hour, are just now leaving the Kuiper Belt. <laughs> uh, this is Halley's Comet taken in 1910. The uh, passage in 1986, I don't know if you remember that, was pretty disappointing. Uh, sometimes the comet tails don't develop well. Comet tails are developed by solar winds, radiation, and ionization. And uh, comets are uh, dark. They're ice mixed with dirt. And we don't see them at all, and they're hard to detect until they get closer and closer. When they're about the distance of Earth from the sun, the, the solar radiation starts uh, burning off, so to speak, the ice, and the tail starts to develop. You can never tell where a comet's going uh, because of the tail, because the tail always points away from the sun. So this doesn't necessarily mean that it's going this way. All it means is the sun is here. It could be on its way back out, and in that case, the tail will still be away from the sun, so the tail is first. That's what uh, you see. Uh, this is Comet Ison, a recent one. This was taken by Dr. Jack Davis and I. There's a lot of objects out there in the Kuiper Belt, many of them uh, bigger than Pluto. That's why downgrading Pluto to a dwarf planet or a planetesimal and making it no longer the ninth planet, uh, they did it partially because uh, if they kept Pluto as a planet, we keep co discovering more and more objects out there, and we'd have to have, you know, 50, 60, 100 planets. So poor Pluto took the heat. In January this year, on the 20th, they announced that Caltech had uh, found evidence of a new planet. Uh, it's, they're calling it Planet Nine, which is funny because uh, they say the very worst science fiction movies ever were uh, the Killer Tomatoes from space and, and another movie called Planet Nine. <laughs> so they call this Planet Nine. It is gigantic. It takes 20,000 years to go around the sun. Uh, it uh, is way, way out there. It's 10 times the size of the Earth. Uh, and uh, this is an actual photograph. Uh, uh, they discovered this without seeing it. Uh, just like Neptune, astronomers were observing the movement of other objects, asteroids, other planets even, and you can tell if there's an object out there. If there's enough objects moving, we can calculate uh, the size of whatever it is that's out there and uh, uh, its motion and so on. And that's the way they discovered Neptune. They figured out Neptune was there uh, mathematically, then looked for it and later and found it. Uh, Planet Nine is so far out that uh, uh, it's very difficult to see. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's, uh, I think it's 50 billion, I, yeah, 50 billion miles from the sun. Uh, so they figured it out mathematically. Now most of the tests that I'm gonna give you it's pretty easy, you know, it's just numbers. Uh, but the, the formula for this, I want you to uh, be able to duplicate it.
that's quite a formula. And by the way, it, I think it's my wife's meatloaf recipe or something. It's, it's just something I threw together. Uh, in March uh, 2004, the European Space Agency launched a uh, spacecraft called Rosetta. The plan was to take a four billion mile journey that would take it uh, uh, like 10 years and pull up next to a comet that was discovered by a Russian team and we'll call it uh, uh, 67P is the name of the comet because I can't pronounce that. Uh, so they sent it up. Um, the, uh, um, it rendezvoused with, a, uh, with the comet uh, 67P after 10 years and five months. And it went around the sun five times uh, to get up uh, to a uh, high velocity because it had to pull up next to the comet after circling the sun five times, traveling for over 10 years, and uh, reaching the speed of 70,000 miles an hour so it could pull up next to the comet. And uh, it did it uh, right on schedule. This was a Euro European consortium. Generally the same groups that uh, have the uh, uh, A380 aircraft. Um, so it entered orbit uh, 19 miles from the surface of the com comet after all of that. So it just did uh, all of this uh, to gain speed. Um, uh, and I'll show you pictures of it. Uh, but first, I want you to stare at the middle of this <laughs> drawing. You will take your wallet <laughs> and put it on your seat when you leave. <laughs> Keep looking in the middle. So uh, well, this is a uh, computer simulation. This is the actual comet. Most comets are uh, like asteroids. They're kind of like potatoes. The nucleus has all kinds of odd shapes. They wanted to drop this little uh, lander. It's called Filet. Uh, from the Rosetta. They wanted to drop it down onto the comet. The comet and the spacecraft are going 70,000 miles an hour. They're going to drop that and it's going to uh, uh, hopefully hit the surface of the comet at only 2.2 miles an hour. And when it hits, it's got a harpoon uh, and legs. The harpoon shoots out the bottom, anchors it to the comet because the comet's so small, it doesn't have a lot of gravity and this thing could fall off. Uh, so they launched it. It uh, uh, came down onto the comet a little too fast. So it bounced twice. Uh, this is a picture it took as it's approaching the comet. They wanted it to land in this little saddle because there was an open area that appeared to be just ice and then rocks on each side. So that was the perfect landing spot. So it's heading right to there. Uh, it landed, bounced, and then uh, came to a stop, but it was moving a little. Now, you see, comets, uh, like asteroids, kind of tumble. And it took this picture on a comet. Looking at this mountain, uh, the other half of the potato, this is the open area. So it's right here looking uh, that way at this mountain across this little valley. And that's what that is. Well, they wanted it to be out in the open so it could take a panoramic view. So they turned the camera, and this is what they got. Just a rock. The thing had bounced, and it landed next to a rock face, little cliff. So they couldn't see anything. It's staring at a rock. That's one of its feet. Uh, it tested uh, the, the uh, composition because everybody thought that this should be made out of H2O water. Uh, it's a comet, it's full of wa uh, frozen water. It wasn't, it was heavy water, deuterium. That has shocked the scientific community because of all things that should have water like Earth, it should be the comet. So they're regrouping on that. The Oort clouds out beyond that, that's where, those are ice. This is just a painting looking towards the sun. The Oort cloud is not like all the planets and all the asteroids which uh, circle the sun in one plane. They're all like this. Uh, the Oort cloud is a sphere, uh, rounded, like, in, like you're inside of a basketball. Um, so uh, uh, the Oort cloud surrounds the solar system. We used to think the solar system, system ended at Pluto, then the Kuiper belt was discovered, and then the Oort cloud. 
the Oort cloud is so far away from the sun that, uh, well, I can tell you, it's nine trillion miles from the sun. That is a year and a half uh, light speed. One and a half light years from the sun is this big ball of ice, which is the last part of the solar system. Everything out to it, including it, is part of the solar system. So the solar system has become this huge object. The nearest star is four light years plus away from us. So if Alpha Centauri has a similar cloud that comes out a light year and a half, then uh, uh, there's only really one light year between the influence of each of these stars, our sun and Alpha Centauri. Comets that uh, take more than 200 years come from there. Hyperbolic comets, we can uh, uh, figure out their orbit. That's called the orbit, uh, that's called ephemeris. We can figure out the orbit. Well, this comet uh, came by, comet C 1981 came by, and uh, they calculated the orbit, and uh, uh, last time it was here was 7.1 million years ago. 7.1 million years. But it's a hyperbolic comet now, which means sometimes they get too close to the sun and they get an extra boost, a slingshot effect. When uh, 1980 E1 left uh, the solar system, it's never going to come back because it got that boost. It's got enough speed. It's going to escape the gravitational influence of the solar system. Uh, so the sun's here, all the planets, uh, then the Kuiper belt, uh, the uh, Oort cloud, and then uh, way out there, the nearest star. Interstellar space. It's an actual photograph of me when I became the first man to land uh, in Verdi. <laughs> uh, the space between the stars, interstellar space. We have been looking for uh, planets uh, around other stars ever since the first one that was discovered uh, 15 years ago. Uh, since that time, we have missions like the Kepler mission, which has placed a telescope uh, out in space. It's looking at 10 degrees square area in the constellation Cygnus. If you take your hands and make a square out of your thumbs and forefingers and put them out at arm's length, then th and look at the sky, that's 10 degrees. So it's only looking at that little patch of sky. It's been doing that now uh, for a few years. And we have now, as of March 1st, uh, have discovered 5,656 new planets. The estimate now in the galaxy, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is that very likely there are uh, in excess of eight billion planets. And then people say, you know, is there life out there? Well, yeah, yeah. His name is Bob. <laughs> this is a star cluster. This is, uh, uh, in our galaxy, there are areas where stars were born out of a big nebula. Nebula is a gaseous cloud. And in that cloud is a, a thing called hydrogen. And you get enough hydrogen together, and it starts to glom together, hydrogen atoms, uh, until it's like a snowball going down the hill. So this big glob of hydrogen gets bigger and bigger in a gaseous cloud called a nebula. When it gets uh, big enough and compact enough, the temperature in the middle starts to get really high, like a million degrees. And then a thing happens, and that thing uh, is called fusion. It becomes a nuclear bomb, a gigantic nuclear bomb. And when it does that, it burns the hydrogen, and every four atoms of hydrogen, this is as technical as I'm going to get, every four atoms of hydrogen uh, transform into, a, uh, into an atom of helium. Well, remember, you can't destroy matter, so what's the rest of it? What happened to the rest of it? Energy. So our sun is burning about three million tons of hydrogen, uh, three million tons of hydrogen burns on the sun in, every day. So out of that uh, cloud came all these stars. This one bunch of stars, the Omega Centauri star cluster, uh, is really old, almost the age of the entire universe. It's 12 billion years old. Uh, and uh, 
It contains about 10 million stars. Uh, this is an example. This is a nebula. This is hydrogen gas. It must have been gigantic at one time because these stars that are in this cluster were developed out of this nebula. Okay. This is a great example, NGC 602. NGC 602, uh, you know, they got to start naming these things. Uh, this was a big cloud of hydrogen. This is a photograph. This is the Hubble. Does it have color? Yeah, it does. Hydrogen ends up uh, being a blue tone and so on. Uh, so this was a giant nebula, and then it started using up hydrogen to form these new stars. So what you've got is what looks like a cave, because it ate up all that hydrogen to form these stars. That's how it works. Our sun was formed that way. This is the Eagle Nebula, which uh, um, is a... Uh, is, you can see it in the uh, constellation Orion. Uh, the Eagle Nebula has these features that are clouds. They are clouds of hydrogen, and they're dark because they have heavy metals. And I don't mean, you know, Aerosmith, and I mean heavy metal metals. And they're forming stars. Well, this uh, area from here to uh, over here somewhere, uh, this is about uh, 300,000 light years. It's big. This area right in the middle has been photographed by Hubble, and uh, so is this thing. This thing is called the ferry. I'll show you why. Uh, we took uh, this image of it, Jack Davis and I. Uh, we used a red filter, uh, which uh, is going to show you, uh, oh, nitrogen, some hydrogen. Uh, but that's our photograph. Uh, this is Hubble's. Hubble has better color. Those two areas I told you about, that's uh, this uh, nebulosity there and this thing. This looks like a ferry. I think it looks like, uh, um, oh my gosh, I just forgot what the name of the Rolls Royce hood ornament. The flying lady, what are they? Spirit of Ecstasy, that's it. That's a Rolls Royce hood ornament. Uh, so uh, that pictures, those pictures came from this one. And what they did is they made close-ups. These are uh, NASA designations, shows uh, the years. Uh, this is the ferry. Uh, beautiful nebula. Look at the light. That is a star being born at the upper end of this nebula. And this is the, uh, the feature in the middle. It's called the Pillars of Creation. It is considered the number one poster uh, that NASA has ever put out. It's a fantastic photograph. What you uh, need to know is how big this is. I'll tell you in a second. Up at the top is light emanating from inside, and there are stars being born in this uh, uh, as we speak. Well, not as we speak, 7,000 years ago. This is 7,000 light years away. Uh, so if you look at that from the pillars of creation, if you took our whole solar system and put it into this photograph, it would be the size of that white dot. It is, yes, uh, it is, um, oh, geez, four million light years from here to the top. That's one cloud in this. So space is big. This is the Horsehead Nebula in Orion. Uh, that was taken by Dr. Davis and I. The Witch's Broom Nebula. I really love that. That's a, a beautiful picture. The Crab Nebula is uh, 6,500 uh, 6, light years away. In the year uh, 1000 AD, 1000 years ago, the people in Europe observed a bright light in the sky. Uh, to give you an idea of the time, that's uh, 95 years before the first crusade. They saw a light in the daytime sky, a bright light. It, and that is when this exploded. This had been a star. 
When a star explodes, typical star like ours, it's called a nova. If the star is huge, it's called a supernova. When it does that, it explodes. It sends ejecta of hydrogen. Remember, the stars are hydrogen. And uh, other metals uh, and heavy metals sends them outward. Uh, so that light from that explosion took 6,500 years to get to Earth. They saw it in, uh, in 1000 AD. A thousand years have passed since then. So how long ago did it occur? Don't say, no, wait, don't say Tuesday. Uh, a thousand years have, have gone by since it was observed. It took 6,500 years for that light to, to get here. So this uh, blew up 7,500 years ago. It's still expanding. They have calculated that this cloud, uh, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's uh, growing at about 300 kilometers uh, a second. Um, I'd like to get a radar gun on it. But. Oh, yeah, okay, I got a problem. A galaxy uh, comes from the Greek galaxis, which just means uh, milk. And uh, you, uh, uh, the Greeks observed the Milky Way at night, big path of stars. And uh, that's where we got the name galaxy. The common galaxy is called a spiral galaxy. Uh, we thought that our galaxy was a spiral like this, um, but uh, uh, it's not. It's called, a, ours is a barred spiral. This one uh, is a, a different galaxy. This is uh, the Whirlpool galaxy, I think, M51. Uh, this picture and the picture of the Andromeda galaxy that I started the lecture with those two pictures are on the internet a lot, and they say, uh, NASA announces photo finally taken of our galaxy. Well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, <laughs> literally, to figure out that is impossible. Nothing has been out that far to turn around and look back at our galaxy. Um, but uh, typically, they contain between 100 million and uh, two trillion stars swirling around. They're in different shapes. They have elliptical galaxies, which are misshapen. They have globular and so on. Um, this is a, a map of what our galaxy looks like. See, we just always assumed, I think it was an assumption, that, uh, that ours would look like this, because we've seen so many like this. And in the middle, that brightness, that ball of brightness, is just the a concentration of stars. Our galaxy has 300 billion stars, and it's one of 350 billion galaxies. I start losing zeros. Uh, so if this has 200 billion stars, then uh, probably 20% of them are in the middle. So it looks like a solid white uh, uh, light. Our galaxy, we now know, is uh, called a barred, barred spiral. And at the end of our uh, barred uh, core uh, comes these uh, two big arms. And we are, our solar system is right here. So uh, one of the uh, arms, the Perseus arm, has a little split called the Sagittarius arm. We're on it. And it splits away right there, comes this way. And then it splits again into a little, another arm. And those are called spurs. And that's the Orion Spur. And our star is right there. And of course, this uh, depiction is much bigger than our star. Uh, but that's where we're at. We're, uh, oh, about 30,000 light years from the center of our galaxy. And then there's another maybe 60,000 light years uh, beyond that. But that's where we're at. Uh, So when you want to see it, I took this photograph from the observatory. If you get on some high ground somewhere, uh, only during the summer, get on high ground, look to the south. From the observatory, which is on the mountain above Carson City, if you look towards Markleyville down that way, you'll see the uh, 
uh, band of stars rising right there, tends to come over us and move a little towards the northeast. And that's the Milky Way. What are you looking at? You're looking at the edge, edge on through the galaxy. So when you're seeing this, uh, looking towards the south, there's a dense amount of light right in here. Of all the Milky Way, uh, the most light is in this area in general. Well, that's the center of the galaxy, that big glob of stars. And it's in Sagittarius, the constellation Sagittarius. And that's why one of the big arms is called the Sagittarius arm. But you're looking towards the center. The problem is we can't see in the center. We can see results of objects in the center. And we know that stars have been moving for forever towards an object. And uh, they disappear. We can do this with uh, some infrared equipment, and we can do the math. Well, some guys can do the math. I can't do the math. Uh, I had to subtract you know, 65 from 70 so I could write five miles an hour over. <laughs> I wasn't a traffic cop. I was a, I was a deputy sheriff. And before that, Honolulu Police Department. Um, it was a tough life. <laughs> Stolen surfboards. <laughs> Boogie board pursuits. <laughs> so uh, what you're doing, you're looking edge on from us towards the center of the galaxy. Well, we can't take pictures <clears throat> of what's in the center of the galaxy. We know that there's a black hole there, a big one. We also think there's 11 other black holes within our galaxy. One of the black holes is in the middle of that star cluster, Omega Centauri, that I showed you. We can't look at in there, so that's called the zone of avoidance. I love that name, zone of avoidance. Uh, telescopes doesn't do any good, because we can't see in there. Edge on, it's kind of like this. This is the disk of the Milky Way. These are clouds of stars kind of around it. And we can't look at the center because of all the material in between. And I was asked once, uh, do you have a better picture of the zone of avoidance? Well, I do. <laughs> I told my grandson, you come in without wiping your feet one more time. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, alligator was actually pretty docile. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a Photoshop. So. You know, it's really kind of weird. You would think I would have told him to go do that, but he did it on his own. <laughs> a black hole is simply a place where everything is uh, drawn into it because of its immense gravity. Uh, so uh, if we could take a picture of it directly, it would look something like this. The edge of this hole, where the stars are spinning faster and faster, uh, is called the event horizon, the edge. Once a star goes in there, it's gone. The black hole in the middle of our galaxy, uh, we know, contains uh, the equivalent of four million stars that have already been eaten up by this thing. Uh, they go in there, uh, and we don't know where they, what happens to them. We don't know. Lots of theories about that's your wormhole. That's your gate to one of those parallel universes. Uh, works for me. Also, uh, the gravity so immense, you've heard this, light cannot escape it. So if we could see it, it'd be like this. It's just an absence of anything. Uh, what happens sometimes is uh, most stars are, are two stars together. When you look at the night sky, on the best and most clear nights you've ever seen, like maybe camping somewhere, and you look at the sky, the, not counting the Milky Way, because you can't count all the stars, night, but on the best night with good viewing, chances are you're looking at about 6,000 points of light, uh, 6,000 stars. But we know that over 50%, some scientists think 65%, of all those stars are two or more. Uh, called a binary group. Uh, our sun is unusual because it doesn't have a companion. 
uh, most stars, the vast majority of stars that you see are two. There are uh, three star groups, four stars, so on. <clears throat> Biggest known is four. Uh, so you're looking at a lot more stars than you think. When a binary star system, two stars, and by the way, they orbit around each other. They're in this kind of cosmic dance thing. When they get pulled into a black hole, the smallest one uh, gets pulled in first, and it gets stripped away from its companion star. And it's just like you stretched it with a rubber band and then snapped the rubber band because it gets a rebound effect, and the star that didn't get sucked in first gets thrown out. And those are called hypervelocity stars. Those stars also are referred to as rogue stars because when they come out of that thing, they just get thrown at, uh, oh, almost two million miles an hour. And they're thrown and they head out of the galaxy, a loose uh, rogue star. Uh, and then it mourns its buddy that got pulled in. If you took a picture, uh, in the black hole, uh, <laughs> and you want, I'll show it to you from another angle. <laughs> February 11th, uh, something that Einstein predicted 100 years ago. In 1916, Einstein predicted that there was a ripple in the universe everywhere this thing, a distortion. And that distortion, in one of his papers, he called a gravitational wave, a gravity wave. He predicted it 100 years ago. And then uh, February 11th, uh, it was confirmed that there was this uh, ripple detected. Uh, so some investigation started. It soon became clear that uh, it occurred long ways away from us. And what had happened was two black holes like I, the black holes I just showed you, like that. Two of them were approaching each other. Well, this is going to be the biggest explosion possible because you've got two immense gravity uh, anomalies that are coming towards each other. And get this, they, would, they approach the speed of light. Well, Einstein said that we can't exceed the speed of light. There's already scientists now saying that this is almost sacrilege, that Einstein may be wrong that black holes may approach the speed of light. So they collide together in this enormous uh, explosion. Uh, and then uh, out of that emerges one black hole and these waves that head out, these ripples. And these ripple time and space. And this gets uh, too deep, really. It's a uh, distortion of time and space means that all of the physics just gets thrown out of the window and uh, an object that you see one day uh, won't look the same. Uh, time gets changed just like it would if we were going the speed of light. Um, alignments uh, uh, get moved. Uh, alignments uh, like uh, um, electrons uh, orbiting the nucleus of an atom. Down to that scale, it disturbs the force. And those are gravitational waves, and that happens. The interesting thing is the, uh, um, the energy released the, of the one that we finally saw, and by the way, that occurred a couple billion years ago, and we're just getting it now. The energy released was greater than all the energy of all the stars you see. All the, greater than that. That's a huge, huge explosion. And I put together a simplistic uh, demonstration, uh, but you've got to pretend a lot. So here you've got two uh, black holes coming towards each other. Obviously, these black holes live in Waikiki. <laughs> pretend this is in space. Pretend the beach balls are black holes. Pretend they are moving at near light speed towards each other. That's step one. Uh, pretend they collide in a furious bang. That's that. That would be number two. Uh, the uh, furious bang creates a new black hole and pretend that this event results in a gravitational field which ripples outward, distorting space and time. Those are the two ways. 
And that's what it does. And now that we are getting a machine that can detect this, we're finding out this is going on everywhere. There are ripples coming from all kinds of directions. Uh, if black holes can exceed the speed of sound, folks, uh, speed of light, then that black hole, theoretically, the math works, is a passageway to one of the multiverses, one of the parallel universes. How freaky is that? The Andromeda galaxy is 2.2 uh, million light years away. It looks like our galaxy would look. Uh, this is a uh, image taken at uh, the observatory. Uh, I got to warn you that even though space in general is randomly expanding away from ev everything, uh, and draw there are different objects that are going towards each other. And I'm going to be wrapping up here. Uh, and Andromeda and our Milky Way are going towards each other. Mm. So set your calendar because in about three billion years, we're going to merge. This is uh, uh, NGC 1300. That's the uh, new general catalog. Uh, it's 60 million light years away. This is M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. It collided with another galaxy billions of years ago. And that's it in the distance. Uh, this uh, galaxy has pulled stars out of the smaller one. That's that. That's called a light bridge. This is uh, the mice, two galaxies that are colliding together. The collision, uh, the gravitational forces, tears them apart and reshapes them. This is my favorite. This is M104, the Sombrero Galaxy. Uh, this is my favorite. Uh, this galaxy is 29 million light years away, and it's stunning, uh, absolutely beautiful. Uh, deep space, quickly. Uh, this is a cluster of galaxies. We cannot look out at another galaxy like this without seeing a star that's in our galaxy in the foreground. If you see a star in a galaxy photograph that looks like uh, the star of Bethlehem, this is called the uh, light refraction. If you see that, that is a star in our own galaxy. Anything else in these pictures of deep space Everything else, every spot, everything, those are all galaxies in the far distance. So when you look at deep space, this is a galactic cluster. Uh, the nearest uh, galaxy in this photograph, which actually is the elliptical galaxy there, is uh, 490 million light years away, half a billion light years away. And if, if you look at it, that star, that one, that one, this one, and a couple others, those are in our galaxy. Every spot, every little thing in this entire picture, except for those few, this red spot, all of these, you probably can't see from way back there, but if you're up here, there's a bunch of them in there. Those are all galaxies. This is a Hubble photograph, and that area is tiny. That, uh, well, I'll show you on a different one. This one, Hubble uh, was not reserved for research for 10 days. So for 10 days, uh, 24 hours a day, they uh, electronically uh, did the equivalent of leaving the shutter open on the Hubble. So it collected light. Uh, the big thing with telescopes, they're a light bucket. You want to get as much light as you can. Uh, the bigger the lens, the bigger the bucket gets more light. Distant objects, we have to use time exposures and we stack them. Those photographs that Dr. Davis and I took, uh, uh, most of those took 60 to uh, 80 images, each one with an exposure time of about an hour and a half. So this kind of stuff takes a lot of work. Well, it's not work. You got to sit there and drink coffee <laughs> and donuts. I defy anybody in this room to know more about donuts than I do. <laughs> I'm serious. I can smell a glazed uh, donut from upwind for 50 miles. Okay. The Hubble Deep uh, Ultra Deep Field is this. 
This photograph, uh, one they, you know, one that's high resolution, and they counted it, has 10,000 galaxies in it. 10,000. Uh, each one of these, even these tiny points, uh, will contain between 100 million and 2 trillion stars each. And you know how much space that is? When Hubble is resolving the greatest distance photographs it uses, uh, no, uh, the photograph, this is uh, my show and tell portion of the presentation. <laughs> well, I can't even, yeah. oh, I got it. This is a pen. The end of the pen uh, is, uh, as you can see, it's about this big around. If you held this pen at arm's length, that end of the pen, about the size of an eraser, that's how much area this is. Telescopes take, uh, the telescope I use, uh, it's pretty big. I'm only looking at uh, a piece of space the size of my thumb. So in this area that if you held your hand up, the diameter of an eraser uh, has 10,000 galaxies you can view in that spot. Then people ask, are there aliens? <laughs> Seriously. Uh, how many spots that size are in the entire sphere of the universe? <laughs> More than five. Every lecture, somebody comes up and says, well, I believe there are aliens because they built the pyramids, didn't they? <laughs> no. Uh, everybody I know that uh, does this kind of stuff will tell you, yeah, there's life. There's got to be life. Uh, we believe that within the next four years, we will find evidence of life uh, not on Earth. Within four years. Chances are, and I don't mean live, walking, talking people. But uh, we'll probably find uh, some kind of uh, fossilized bacillus or something on Mars, probably first, or Titan, the moon Titan. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the problem is we keep looking for life like us. You know, and that's the big flaw in the system. I keep telling people this, that uh, people at NASA, you know, stop looking for life like us. There's a uh, so many possibilities. Uh, so anyway, I looked in a lot of places like the pyramids. I never saw no stinking alien. <laughs> uh, I don't know, you know, if we knew what everything was, if we knew uh, does the universe have a boundary, if we knew that it didn't, uh, if we knew why comets are so weird and they don't have real water, and if we knew uh, why do we pay politicians? Uh, these, kinds of, <laughs> these kinds of questions haunt us. And uh, the truth of the matter is, I kind of like it all being a big mystery. I like looking at stuff like this. I like viewing presentations where when I leave, I'm thinking about them. I like to think about things that you talk with your kids about around the dining room table. Uh, so maybe some mysteries... Uh, I hope some just never get solved. I really don't. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.